All right, I think we can begin. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I am Tom Moore, a senior advisor at the National Committee on US-China Relations. And we are so glad you could join us for today's program entitled, Our Shared Technological Future, Autonomous Vehicles in the US and China. The National Committee has been expanding its programming in technological innovation. And thanks to the generous sponsorship of BlackBerry, we have put together a two-part series on technological cooperation between the United States and China. The next event, which will be on smart cities, will take place in early May. Information about that event will go up on our website soon. In recent years, the technological competition between the United States and China has become more intense, especially in the core technological fields of semiconductors, AI, and 5G. While competition is inevitable, there are many areas where our two nations can work together and innovate, one of them being autonomous vehicles or AV. Autonomous vehicles and their implementation at scale will greatly change transportation and cities in both countries. Today, we have three speakers who will discuss the many challenges and opportunities this technology presents. They are John Wall of BlackBerry, who will discuss autonomous vehicles in North America, Michael Yuan of Thundersoft, an expert on autonomous vehicles in China, and Carlin Stanley, an expert on AV policy and risk management. We look forward to hearing their insights about exciting new areas for innovation. You have all of their bios, so I won't go into more detail on their backgrounds. Each speaker will give a short presentation, followed by a moderated discussion between them, which will be followed by questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will start off with John Wall, who will discuss AV in North America. John? Hey, Tom, thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the trends uh, when we started to see AV actually start to, to grow in North America. So, you know, I think we recognize today that the most important trend in automotive is described by the acronym CASE, and that's connected, autonomous, shared mobility, and electrification. So when we talk about connected, we're talking about connected to the internet, connected to infrastructure, connected to the world around the vehicle. Autonomous, of course, is anything controlling the vehicle, uh, you know, whether it's braking, steering, or acceleration. Shared mobility is how we may look at buying cars in the future. You know, will we own a car or will we share a car? Uh, we, we do know one thing for sure, in 10 years, it will look very different than it looks today. And then electrification, which is probably the fastest growing trend. I don't think anybody could have imagined how quickly the car makers are moving in this direction. Some car makers are talking about getting rid of internal combustion engines in five years. Hmm. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. So we, BlackBerry, started seeing some serious interest in autonomous drive uh, probably at the start of 2014. And that really quickly ramped over the next couple of years. By 2016 and 17, most OEMs and large automotive tier ones had developed programs to pursue autonomous drive technology. It quickly became very competitive with OEMs and tier ones investing large amounts of money, trying to be the first to the market. The mounting pressure to go fast uh, and develop true autonomous drive. And when I talk about true autonomous drive, I'm talking about L4, L5, which is go anywhere, uh, anytime. Uh, was really driven by companies like Tesla and Google. And what we see today, uh, Tesla, or sorry, Google is Waymo. Tesla in particular, they were very, very clever. They were very aggressive in developing uh, driving aids that they cleverly marketed as autopilot. Uh, the first version of autopilot was launched in late 2014. So it's so quite a long time ago. You know, the competition became so fierce some car companies were actually claiming that by 2020, they'd be shipping cars without steering wheels. It was a, a pretty ludicrous statement at the time, uh, but that just goes to show you how, how fierce the competition was. I think the time frame also marked a very important recogni recognition by most OEMs that software and electronics was going to become a very important brand differentiator for the car makers. Car companies started investing large dollars into software. And this actual trend is continuing to this day. This is continuing stronger and stronger. Around the 2019 timeframe, it was becoming obvious that fully autonomous drive vehicles, L4, L5, go anywhere, anytime, was fraught with challenges at every level. Very high cost of development, technical challenges, 
lack of infrastructure and regulation. So this has slowed autonomous drive development for consumer cars. What we are seeing is that commercial vehicles will probably be the first example of autonomous vehicles on the road. Think robo taxis in a very limited geography, a heavy equipment, mining vehicles, for instance, trucking sp spurred on by the lack of drivers, agriculture, you know, those types of use cases. All these applications have the advantage of being able to amortize the high cost of automation over a higher duty cycle and an application that can be very much contained. Producers of consumer vehicles are more focused on lower levels of self-driving, L1, L2, L3. These are things like traffic jam assist, self-parking, collision avoidance, blind spot detection, safety features that will help save lives. These systems will evolve over time to bring more and more autonomy to the car. Most of the OEMs that I've spoken to believe that consumers will be much more accepting of, of, of autonomous drive if it's introduced into, to them in a very gradual way, which every couple of years, there'll be more features added to the vehicles. And over a 20 year span, you might have higher levels of autonomy in consumer vehicles. You know, and an interesting side effect of the quest for autonomous drive is that car makers have had to come to the realization that the car's electrical architecture is not up to the challenge. So this has created a profound effect on the vehicle. Today, the way the architecture of the vehicle is defined is we have a number of ECUs, which are electronic control units. You can think of these as tiny single function computers that perform a function within the vehicle. Think of your door locks, think of your dome light, think of your transmission, your braking. These are all individual ECUs control, that are controlled by these individual ECUs. Luxury vehicles can easily have over 150 ECUs, all connected via very old networking technology developed in the 80s. So obviously when you start thinking of autonomous drive, you have to think about high throughput of data. So what that's led to is a re-architecting of the electrical architecture of the vehicle based on domain controllers. So you can think of domain controllers as computers like laptops, what's in your phone, what we're going to do is we're going to consolidate a lot of the functions that are running on individual ECUs onto these domain controllers. And the domain controllers will be, con will be connected via high-speed networking. So you can think of it almost as a data center within the vehicle. And you'll have, instead of having 150 of these, you'll have a handful of these, but they'll be much more complex. So the knock-on effect of this is now that you have high-performance compute platform within the vehicle, now you start thinking of an app ecosystem within the vehicle. So now what the car companies are starting to look at is, can we develop an app ecosystem that's similar to what the handset makers have developed? And this becomes very compelling to be able to sell services and applications to the end user and to be able to leverage the data being produced by the vehicle. Uh, what we think is going to happen is that the car companies will go off and create their individual ecosystems. Then you'll have companies like Apple and Google who are also interested in building cars. They have their app ecosystems and they're certainly experts at developing those. And then you have all the startups that kind of have a clean sheet of what they want to develop. And what we think is going to happen is you're going to have all these app ecosystems. And over time, similar to what happened in the smartphone, you'll have a consolidation of these ecosystems to maybe a handful of them. And we don't know who the winner of this race to the app ecosystem for the car will be, but it's, it's without a doubt it's coming. And then similar to that is the amount of data that the vehicles can generate will start to become very, very valuable. Most car companies believe that the money that will be made in vehicles will be recurring services and subscription fees based on the data that the car generates. For me, that, that is the more interesting aspect of what autonomous drive is driving. Well, John, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. There's a lot of, lot of stuff there. So it sounds like people, companies that manufacture, or as you put it, original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, that some of the ones that are, are producing smartphones today may end up producing automobiles in the not too distant future. So Absolutely. You know, with, with removing the internal combustion engine has reduced the barrier for entry for people to build cars. You get rid of transmissions, you get rid of internal combustion engines. 
you now have an easier barrier, a, a lower bar to get into the industry. Oh, great. Well, let's see what's going on in China in this regard. So if I can turn it to Michael. Thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Yuan, Senior Vice President and General Manager supporting Thundersoft North American Businesses. Uh, I'm not in China, so don't let my uh, background fool you. Uh, I'm actually in the uh, Silicon Valley based Bay Area. Uh, I live in Chicago with offices also in San Diego, Detroit, and Toronto, Canada. Um, Thundersoft is a global technology solution company focusing in the automotive and mobility industries, corporate headquartered in Beijing in China. Uh, living in the US uh, for the past 40 years and working for a Chinese public traded company, give me a good perspective of the autonomous driving technologies and industry trends in both countries. Uh, currently, China's aut uh, automotive industry is in the midst of a technology transformation. With strong government support, many companies are developing technologies focusing on autonomous driving ecosystem, which uh, John mentioned that uh, can be cars, trucks, buses, bikes, uh, delivery, sanitation, or farming equipment. So there's all kinds of uh, possibility that this te technology can enable. Uh, China in particular focusing on autonomous driving technologies are mainly motivated by reducing traffic congestion increase safety, improve environment, increase uh, access and convenience of public transportation. Uh, comparing US and China approach in developing autonomous driving technologies, American companies today seems to be more focused on enhancing vehicle intelligence to approach the level of human drivers through perceptions and learning. So the vehicle completely relies on its own sensors and decision making control systems. On the other hand, China's focus is creating network connected auto autonomous driving systems. And this approach relies on high speed, low latency wireless communication technologies such as 5G to exchange data between onboard sensors and surrounding information sources. This kind of uh, intelligent transportation system connects vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to people and vehicle to cloud leveraging standard and protocols such as CB2X, which is a cellular-based technology connecting vehicles to everything. Uh, China's approach relies on a large number of supporting infrastructure, which means it cannot, uh, uh, it's not somebody or one or several companies can accomplish by themselves. It requires extremely complex multi-field technology, uh, new consumer and public products and large initial investment. In China, uh, whenever large infrastructure and investments involve government organizations will play an important role. In such environment, companies must cooperate closely with each other and supported by government guidelines and uh, financial assistance. So the result is not unexpected. The relationship between companies will form a strong division of roles and responsibilities, focusing on its own core competencies and business interests. So far, companies have excelled in various fields such as AI algorithms, computer vision, millimeter wave radar, LIDAR, ultrasonic sensors, high precision maps, 5G communication, smart traffic lights and, and, and street lights. As a result, a relatively complete supply chain and ecosystem have been formed in China. Uh, from an individual company's perspective, the leading companies in autonomous driving technology in the US and China are Google and Baidu. Mm -hmm. Google's Waymo division is committed to develop its own autonomous driving technology similar to Apple's iOS operating system and then applying it to uh, various type of vehicles and business models to uh, build it close, uh, to build the ecosystem and then also uh, pretty much control by itself. Uh, Baidu Apollo, on the other hand, chose to uh, a different di direction. Baidu is offering an open source software and free simulation test platform to um, companies and developers free of charge. The goal is to collect large amount of data, continuously improve its AI algorithm, and attract more companies to this ecosystem. In other words, Baidu is determined to create the Android of the future auto automotive industry. At the present, over 200 global enterprises have joined the Baidu ecosystem. Uh, Baidu has been uh, developing and testing autonomous uh, technology since 
2013, uh, and uh, they have good uh, history already, uh, but they're still uh, catching up the, uh, the US. Uh, but they are the leader in China for, the large, for their large fleet size, test miles, and advanced technologies. They have received licenses to operate in 10 China cities already with over 200 test vehicles. Their cars are generally equipped with 12 cam cameras, one long range radar, four mid range radars, plus uh, 12 ultrason uh, ultrasonic sensors. In October, 2020, Baidu announced free rides to passengers in Beijing uh, with manned level four autonomous vehicles. Also in October, 2020, they received permit from the city of Changsha, Hunan province uh, for operating about 130 unmanned vehicles and uh, 30 taxi stations around the uh, Changsha city. Uh, in addition to Baidu, there are many other companies already aggressively developing autonomous driving technology and conducting trials in China. AutoX, a six-year-old autonomous driving startup founded by a former assistant professor at Princeton University, has opened its global taxi program to the public in Shenzhen, uh, near Hong Kong. This marks the, uh, the first time that the general public can book a completely autonomous robot taxi without safety drivers behind the wheel. Another company called Yutong, a manufacturer of commercial vehicles and electric buses founded in 1963, operates unmanned minibuses in Zhenzhou, Henan province. Their, their buses don't have driver's seats, steering wheels or pedals already. The, uh, they also integrated voice assistance services to control AC, lights, and communicate with passengers. They also have uh, 5G V2X connected to traffic lights, coordinating the bus speeds in real time. Uh, Yutong already has three bus stops in trial with more to come. There are also consumer cars in China market already equipped with some of the technologies, including General Motors, uh, Shanghai GM, Buick GL8, uh, SAIC Smart Electrics SUV, Guangzhou Automotive's uh, AMV, and uh, many to come. I think uh, China has already defined uh, overall in a long-term basis, a 30-year auto uh, automotive infrastructure plan. On uh, February 24 of last year, 2020, uh, the National Development and Reform Commission the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, the Ministry of Science and Technology, and other 11 ministries jointly issue a uh, intelligent vehicle innovation and development strategy, which is considered as the highest level design blueprint for the intelligent transportation system roadmap in China. This blueprint outlines in the first five years to actively promote, uh, promote the development of China's standard smart internet vehicles, intelligent transportation system, and smart city related infrastructure. First leveraging LTE V2X wireless communication network to achieve local regional coverage, then using new generation of 5G V2X vehicles to support citywide and highway services. From 2025 to 2035, the continuous uh, penetration of intelligent internet connected equipment in the automotive and transportation industries will be gradually rolled out and implemented. Finally, from 2035 to 2050, China expects its standard intelligent transport system uh, being fully developed and completed. So they're very aggressive and has a very long-term plan. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That's really interesting. That's gives a great view overview of the markets and I can see some interesting discussions between the US and China right now. But before we get there, Carlin, maybe you can talk us about some of the challenges and you know issues that may be relating to, to autonomous vehicles. Definitely, thanks Tom. I thought what I would do is give you a couple of key highlights from our recent RAND Corporation report on autonomous vehicles and the future of auto insurance. There are two issues there that I think relate very much to what we've just been hearing from uh, John and Michael. And those are, first of all, the importance of consumer acceptance to the deployment of autonomous vehicles. And secondly, the critical issue 
of autonomous vehicle data sharing. So first, I'll just give you a snapshot of what we learned about consumer acceptance. We were able to interview 43 subject matter experts across a wide spectrum of people involved with autonomous vehicle development. And all of the people we spoke with ranked consumer acceptance as the most important issue for the deployment of autonomous vehicles. And this is interesting because in a recent survey by JD Power here in the US, there was a lot of skepticism among people about whether they would actually uh, want to ride in or use an automated or autonomous vehicle. But let's turn to autonomous vehicle data sharing, which we found as we were working on a report was really a very critical issue that's facing the industry. And I thought what we could do is sort of take a, a deep dive into some of the issues and findings of the report. And to do so, I'll tell you quickly about what types of data we're talking about, the importance of the issue, and then give you a snapshot of what we learned from insurers, manufacturers, drivers, and policymakers. And then kind of look at what's the state of play and what does uh, Rand's report uh, provide as recommendations. So we start experts here on the call who know a lot about the kind of data that's produced by autonomous vehicles. There's a huge amount of data that's produced, but insurers particularly are interested in things such as GPS information, vehicle status, driver interventions, occupancy, warnings to the operator, sensor readings and data usage, and vehicle performance. And that's just a quick snapshot, there's many other types of data. But when we had a, a symposium at RAND a little over a year ago that included the insurance industry um, for discussion about autonomous vehicles, we asked them, you know, what was really key about this issue? And we were told that um, Autonomous vehicle data sharing is the top priority public policy issue for the um, auto insurance industry in the US. And in fact, one of the workshop uh, participants told us, and this is a quote, all stakeholders are thinking about data and everyone is guarding them. So why are insurers so interested in getting autonomous vehicle data? Well, this data is needed to resolve claims. It's used now to resolve claims between conventional vehicles, but will be needed to resolve claims between conventional vehicles and autonomous vehicles. It's also important, according to the insurance folks we spoke with, for the development of new insurance products, which will be used for those fleets and autonomous vehicles that are going to be developed. So what about the manufacturers? What do they have to say? Well, they were certainly uh, not interested in sharing their data, at least not now. They have a great concern over the proprietary and conf uh, confidential aspects of data and think that it's really intrinsically linked to many of the different uh, technologies that are being uh, used and developed for autonomous vehicles. And I'll just give you a couple of snapshots. One manufacturer characterized auto insurance companies as, quote, data hungry. And another manufacturer told us that, um, and this is a quote, I don't think it's in a manufacturer's business interest to give them this data just because they're too lazy to do it themselves. They have plenty of ways to get this data, end of that quote. So this perception that autonomous vehicle uh, manufacturers do not have the responsibility to share the data was prevalent in all of the manufacturers and developers that we spoke with. And what about drivers? 
Well, interestingly, in that JD Power survey, the large majority of people who were interviewed said that they would be willing to share their data from an autonomous vehicle if it would help to improve the design of autonomous vehicles, if it would help with safety issues, and generally if it would help the next guy. What about federal regulators? We spoke with a number of regulators, and on the federal side, we learned that indeed federal regulators were monitoring the issue of AV data sharing very carefully. And they said that they were ready to step in to facilitate sharing of data, but they much prefer that the industry find a way to work this out themselves within the industry. But meantime, cities and local transit agencies are, are already moving forward to explore how to share and use AV data. So although there is no current consensus on how to share autonomous vehicle data, there's definitely efforts going forward to try to find a way to do so. And in fact, that's one of the key recommendations of our RAND report. And that is that insurers, manufacturers, and other stakeholders collaborate to develop a framework for collecting and sharing data on autonomous vehicles. So I'll be happy to talk further about our RAND report, but back over to you, Tom. This is all very interesting because it's it's obviously you, I mean, autonomous vehicles uh, is, is still such a developing field. And I feel that in some ways, the transfer from like level one, which is, I guess, almost self-parking cars, if I understand it in my layman's way, to level five, where you basically get into the vehicle and it takes you wherever you go to without any you operating it in any way, is 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 still a you know, it's a time that's this will elapse. And I think that there's a interesting area where in the interim, we will have presumably self-driving cars on the road at the same time as we will have human operated vehicles. I wanna, at the same time, one other observation I wanted to just make was between <clears throat> what John and, and Michael said particularly was that it, it seems to me that connectivity in China is a much bigger thing where the cars will integrate or relay amongst a, a sort of a communal system, if I understand it correctly. Whereas in the US, the autonomous vehicle may be more truly autonomous in that sense um, and operating on its own sensors against uh, you know, the same kind of data that a human driver might do that. So let me talk, talk about this. How do you see that chain, uh, compare and contrast between China and the US in terms of how the vehicle will operate in the the greater world and where where cities might have to adapt to that as well. I know, Michael, it sounds like that, that the, you know, things are being much more integrated in China. Is that the case with cities as well and, and potentially city governments working on that too? Yeah, I think uh, um, that's where uh, China is a little bit more um, collaborative and because the Chi Chinese government has some a uh, little bit more power, a uh, little bit more um, uh, determination in terms of uh, uh, moving moving forward this industry and technology. Uh, and, and if you really think about it, it is very uh, complex and uh, it, it requires many different uh, parties to really support this, this uh, environment. Uh, right. So the government, um, and, and I think uh, uh, the, the uh, um, residents or, or the population in China are, are a little bit more open to, uh, to experiment different technologies. Uh, I've seen uh, people jump on these um, uh, unmanned uh, uh, buses or, or things and they're, they're very uh, eager to, uh, to, to try and, and very supportive of the government of uh, the new initiative uh, because the, you know so far uh, when they transform from uh, you know no no mobile phone to uh, to what it is today you know uh, really brought a lot of convenience to people so there's a lot of um, uh, support from the people perspective and also from a, a local government and central government's perspective uh, they want to make sure that they are um, you know, pushing and, and expanding this technology. 
Okay. I, I think Tom, to that point, I I think in the in the U.S. and North America, there is there will be the same type of infrastructure required: smart lights, uh, VX traffic. I, I just think exactly to Michael's point, it's it's been logistically difficult, uh, and, and it's not been well coordinated. And I think that's kind of what's slowing down that aspect. When when I was talking about it in in a portion of my opening, I mentioned that you know, true level four, level five autonomous drive at the consumer level has slowed. And one of the, ch one of the challenges, definitely infrastructure, you know, who's picking up the cost for all this infrastructure, how's it going to be monetized? You know, it, it's, and it, then it, it actually starts to turn into what Carlin talked about, which is how do, can the car maker, you know, monetize the data that's coming off of their car? I mean, this is really what they want. They want to be able to monetize that data you have cars full of sensors, LIDAR, radar. You could see now that if you could marry that smart car with smart cities, then you could see that that infrastructure potentially could be paid for if somebody is able to monetize the data and that there's you know, a reason beyond autonomous drive to put it in place. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Maybe you're talking about a little bit about the data because it's, it's, it's obviously going to be a wealth of data that is collected, but it may be data everything from conditions of the road to exactly. the car, to perhaps what the passengers are eating at the time they're in the car and therefore what that might say about some, an advertiser who, who might want that data. I mean, can, can somebody talk to you about how the data might be parsed out or you know, uh, you know, looked at from different ownership points of view? You know, it's, 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 it's yeah. a massive amount of data, so. Yeah, so I mean, we, we uh, BlackBerry made an announcement about um, three months ago where we partnered with AWS to create a platform that goes into the vehicle to be able to provide what we call a normalized way of accessing data. One of the challenges uh, with collecting data from vehicles is there is no standard way to collect data from vehicles. You know, Ford vehicle versus a, a you know, Audi vehicle is, doesn't have the same interface. It doesn't, it's all very proprietary to the car maker. And in, in the process of talking about this new platform that we're doing with, with AWS, we made it very clear a couple of things. We're not interested in the data. The data belongs to the, the, the OEM. Uh, our goal is to provide edge processing to provide insights into the vehicle, exactly the types of things you're talking about. What do the cameras see? What does the LIDAR see? What, what's around the vehicle? But at the same time, who's in the car? What are they doing? Uh, Who's in the passenger seat? Carlin made the comment about telemetry information about an accident. Even without autonomous driving, insurance companies want to know that type of information. It's very valuable information. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're seeing the use cases are just unending. And if you, if you create this common interface to all vehicles, so again, start thinking back to Android or iOS, you now develop the power of the, of the app ecosystem developers, and then you will start to see use cases you haven't even thought of and how that data will be monetized. So we've seen it from insurance companies, interest from insurance companies, uh, interest mm -hmm. from the, the telecom companies, interest from just app developers, safety applications, road conditions, environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, it's, 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 your imagination is the limit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I want to echo that. Uh, if you really look at, uh, you know, Thundersoft, we're, we're supporting our customers uh, developing next generation of uh, uh, different features. And we're getting on the average of one gigabyte of information from the cars per second. Uh, I mean, that is a huge number of, of uh, information and data. You know, how do you store it? How do you parse it? Or how do you look at the, uh, the right information that you're looking for? And, and uh, you know, also getting the right information at the right time uh, is, is so critical. Um, so there's, uh, you know, plenty of information, plenty of uh, confusion at this time. Uh, we definitely need to have, um, you know, hopefully standardize it uh, and, and make it a little bit easier uh, for us, but at, at this time, you know, our our goal and our main focus is perfecting the technology, making sure that the uh, uh, the drivers and passengers are safe, making sure that uh, the uh, the cybersecurity are secured, and and making sure that uh, you know the the all the 
sensors and all the um, uh, peripherals are functioning the way they're supposed to be. And Tom, <clears throat> I'll have to follow up on what John said in terms of people who think they can own the data. Actually, I think it's more a question of who can use or access the data. And in a previous study, when we interviewed people from the insurance industry, um, from OEMs, drivers, I'll tell you what they had to say. OEM said, not surprisingly, we own, we own the data, it's our data. Then insurance companies we spoke with said, oh, uh, insurance subscribers sign in their agreement that we get the data, so it's our data. Then we talked to individual uh, subscribers and talked to AAA, for example, and guess what? People think that the data in their car is their data. So finding a way to share this data is really, I think, the big challenge. And John, it's so interesting that you're working on a platform that would facilitate that. Yeah, and we're and we're trying to be to, we're trying to be clear that we're staying out of the data ownership equation. Mm -hmm. That that's up to exactly what you're talking about. The OEMs, you know, will you jump into your car and have to acknowledge that you're giving up your rights to data? You know, like we kind of right. do with our phones. Uh, I'm right. more focused on the technology of making the data accessible. And, mm -hmm. and that if you get into a Ford vehicle, you'll have the same application if you get into a Volkswagen. If you want to mm -hmm. get cloud data from the vehicle, you know, a smart city can't extract data from a car if it's all different. If the right. cars are all talking a different language, for instance. Uh, right. What, what I do know is the quest is to make money. That is the whole <laughs> point right. around data. And that, you know, right. most car companies believe that their business model in the future will revolve around the data that the car generates mm -hmm. to a very large extent. Absolutely. How does that affect, I mean, it's, it's interesting when you think of cars today, how they are marketed and designed differently and have, you know, some cars are designed to, you know, drive faster racing cars and all the rest. I'm not saying that everybody buys a race car, but, you know, you're, when you're making a choice between an SUV or a, yep. you know, a sedan or whatever, it sounds almost like all of the cars of the future are going to have, at least when it comes to the data platforms and stuff, something that functions, inter interacts very smoothly. Like almost, we might all be getting an Android car or an Apple car or something, but the, in terms of the data, the, the software platform and the data management is going to be quite similar. Is that is that the case? I mean, I believe that. I mean, that to me, that's why companies like Baidu and Google and Apple are entering this game. I don't think Apple wants to create a low margin, high liability device when they could build earbuds and make a lot of money. Uh, I mean, it's because the data has so much value. I mean, that, that's my view of it is that the data is what's driving this. The app ecosystem is what's driving this. And, and that's why you see the, the kings of, of app ecosystems, the Baidu's, the iOS and uh, you know Apple and Google getting involved in this. So I, I believe that. Yeah, for sure. I think the, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, business models. And uh, if you look at a lot of the, uh, um, uh, even the car makers are in the, in the process of uh, uh, looking at how can they stay with the drivers after this, you know, the, the dealership are selling the cars to the consumers. Uh, how can they continue to um, uh, monetize the cars and not just one time sale? Um, you know, how can they partner with the, uh, the third uh, parties like the McDonald's, the world, and the, if, if somebody's looking for, for a restaurant, they can, uh, you know, gear them towards the right, uh, you know, partners and, uh, you know, hotel chains if they're driving from one place to the other. So there's definitely a lot of uh, um, um, need and, and also interest on the on the information side. And that's why Google and Baidu and those companies are looking to uh, get into this field. But uh, how likely it is we have a, uh, a standard uh, format and st standard platform that everybody will conform to, uh, it, it remains to be seen. Well, that's interesting. I mean, how does that then affect, say, collaboration, cooperation between US and Chinese companies on these things? And how would it affect how um, you know, Chinese 
automobile manufacturers might want to sell cars, air cars to, to the United States or US yeah. manufacturers sell to, to, to China. You know, is this, this, does this data platform affect that in a, in a very it, correct yeah, way? It, it absolutely does. And, you know, as Michael knows, QNX, the products that, that I support within BlackBerry are very, very popular in China. So for, for self-driving vehicles, uh, for safety systems, uh, you know, for, for consolidation of, of, of ECUs, we have, you know, China is a big market for, for QNX. I think, you know, the challenge when you look at a, a platform like what we're developing with AWS, and of course, we partnered with AWS because you need a gorilla to drive a standard. You need a large company that knows how to drive an ecosystem, has the scale to drive an ecosystem. Uh, the challenge becomes, well, AWS is not the dominant player in, in China. And so we're gonna have to develop relationships potentially with you know, the cloud providers that are dominant in China and see how they, they want to address this challenge. They, everybody wants to address the challenge and everybody wants to sell their cars globally. There is no doubt about it that, and, and Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the Chinese tier ones and the Chinese OEMs want to sell cars across the world. They, you know, there's a huge market in China, but there's also a huge market in the rest of the world. Uh, the car makers in North America want to sell cars into China. You, know, you heard Michael talk about Buick is a big, big brand in China. At least it was four or five years ago. I don't know if it still is, but, you know, so there, there is definitely already a lot of collaboration because nobody can ignore a market like China and China can't ignore the rest of the world as a market. So there is going to be collaboration. There is collaboration, but there'll be changes as well. There are things that we're going to have to account for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for well, sure. I Go ahead, Caroline. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say that, and one of the one of the issues is regulatory, in terms of of what's being required, not only by different nation states for selling uh, automobiles and what's in them, and the approvals that are required, but as you both know, right now in the different U.S. states, there's been a, a move to create different uh, regulation. For example, the data that is being captured by the AV. California has very specific requirements, so does Nevada, just for example. So those sort of differences make it really difficult for a global automaker to standardize the, you know, the technologies and the data capture within the vehicles. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's no, um, you know, you, you cannot have one standard that, that will operate for everybody at every state and, and every country. Uh, there are going to be differences, and uh, which is, the, you know, give us, a company like ours, uh, opportunity to support our customers, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but uh, at, the, at the same time, I think, uh, you know, like John, John mentioned, that uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, interest from Chinese uh, uh, car makers uh, to be able to sell their cars in the U.S. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of uh, research and development already in uh, uh, happening in in in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, company like Neo, uh, Faraday Future, a lot of the uh, EV, the electric uh, vehicle companies are, you know, they have their research and development shops here, right here in, in Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, cross um, uh, exchange already. There's, uh, you know, especially on the, uh, for example, the, the uh, um, CV2X technology, there's, uh, you know, there's, it's a standard. Uh, people, uh, companies are, are developing uh, the different protocols and things that uh, all, all, all the com uh, car companies can can follow, but still, I think uh, uh, a lot of the um, uh, there's still a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, there's uh, we definitely U.S. and China can definitely start uh, collaborating, as you can see. You know, we're we're moving towards um, maybe two different paths and uh, two different uh, ways. Uh, there may be collaboration opportunities for us to help uh, each other to define technology standards in terms of security, safety, uh, operations, privacy, and, and uh, data protection. Um, you know, how do we share uh, big data? Um, I think it will, it will um, um, you know, help 
everybody, if we have a, a, a way to share information, uh, share what works, what the uh, policy and strategy, uh, I think there's a lot of things that we can, we can do together. Hey, Carlin, I, I wanted to pick up on a point you made. So one of the challenges, and it's a European car company, so it's not strictly part of this discussion, but uh, it's a European car company that I won't name, but they developed an L3 level system within their vehicle. And because of different regulations in the different countries in Europe, their system had to be geofenced. So when it traveled from Germany mm -hmm. to uh, Austria, the system had to be turned mm -hmm. off. Right. And, and this was all because of different regulations. I, I know in Canada, right. we have a similar system. All the provinces take do their own regulations. And, you know, mm -hmm. quite frankly, some of the technology is outpacing the government's ability to test and certify some of this technology. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to test it. Uh, right. um, go ahead, Carlin, sorry. I was gonna say, and, and sort of the nightmare scenario is not being able to drive from New York to California here in the US because of different regulations, just as you pointed out, John. Yep. So well, and the car, the car makers don't wanna sell expensive features that you can't use. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's they want to sell it, but but nobody wants to buy them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds to me a little bit like having a cell phone that when you take it out of network, you suddenly can't use it. That is much harder with a vehicle that you need to use for transportation. That's um, right. You can't carry two can't carry two vehicles with you while you're going from place to place like you could with cell phones. Right. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about, about testing. I mean, that seems to have been one of the big issues too. And I know that there's been a dramatic difference in how we test vehicles in North America versus how they're being tested in, in China. Um, has that been a, a major you know, concern or is there a big contrast there between the two, two methods? Um, from an autonomous driving technology perspective, I, I think there's still uh, there, there a, a lot more similarities, a lot more uh, focus. Um, you know, the 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 main uh, issue is the uh, the safety, you know, security, um, and and also the uh, usability you know, from a cu uh, you know customer consumer's perspective. Um, but ultimately, there are differences between U.S. and China. Uh, if you look at uh, if in U.S. Uh, me metropolitan like big cities, you want to make sure that uh, what if those big big buildings uh, cuts off your communication is uh, uh, is the function uh, the technology still works uh, in the rural area. What happens if uh, uh, you know you get uh, ducks crossing, uh, deer crossing, or um, you know golf carts or golf uh, uh, golfers with uh, really fancy Offits, uh, what happens to your uh, autonomous driving capability? Whereas in China, um, there's also you know have to deal with big buildings, uh, you know, uh, communication issues. Uh, but then again, you have to deal with a lot of a lot more people walking, a lot more motorcycles and bicycles and other uh, uh, types of uh, vehicle surroundings. And, and there's a lot of things that uh, you have to deal with so to make sure. But overall, from a testing perspective, uh, you're mainly looking at you know, uh, cybersecurity, uh, making sure that your car is not going to be uh, overtaken by bad guys and uh, make it jump uh, you know, over the roof or anything. Uh, uh, stability, driving from New York to LA, uh, make sure that the, uh, the power consumptions impact the batteries. Uh, making sure that the uh, you know you don't get the smoke coming out or or you have to reboot it uh, you know every 200 miles, uh, but also you know the the uh, the complexity comes in is the uh, functional testing, which is uh, you know it, it's not just simply uh, when you see a pedestrian pedestrian uh, crossing with is the car uh, gonna stop or not, you have to look at from uh, you know you have the uh, 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 the car is driving by itself. You got the GP GPS lady talking. You got the satellite radio music playing. You got the phone, you know, talking with your wife. You got a baby crying in the back. And uh, uh, now a supermodel walks across the street. Does the car stop? Right. So that is one of the things that you want to make sure that all the different combinations 
and and the uh, the more technology that you bring in, the, the more you're gonna uh, you know the more scenarios you have to test to, to test. And then uh, next time is uh, you know if uh, if it's not a supermodel, uh, if somebody else walk across the street, is the car gonna stop? Right. So there's different scenarios and co configurations, and you gotta make sure that uh, you're testing. Yeah, it's 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 very complex and. Uh... You know, I know that, and I'm sure the same is happening in China. A lot of the testing today, obviously, it's done on the road. There's lots of miles being put on by the, the different players that are that are kind of leaders in autonomous drive. But there's also a lot of simulation being built. Uh, there's also a lot more safety considerations that are being developed. For instance, your the car can be functionally safe from the perspective that components don't break, but can you guarantee that your intent is being followed? You know, there's also a lot that we don't know about machine learning. We don't always know how machine learning models actually learn. So as an example, and this is an example I use all the time when I do safety talks, you know, a machine learning model may be able to distinguish between a person and a chicken. So that if it has to make an evasive action and it's going to have to do something to somebody or to something, it picks the chicken. Well, if a man is walking across the street in a chicken suit, how is he going to perceive that person? Because you don't know what it's keyed off. It keyed off a beak. It keyed off different properties of. So I, I think that there's still a lot of challenges uh, in very highly dense, densely populated areas. I still believe autonomous drive for now is going to be limited to very specific use cases, bus situations very controlled environments. I, I can't see an autonomous drive car today safely navigating New York City during rush hour. I just think that's too tall in order to ask for. Well, I, I'm, not... so, I'm sorry. And also I think the, um, uh, you know, when you, when the government also, you know, approve a car, approves a, a um, uh, uh, AI system that does its own self-learning, uh, uh, you also want to make sure that whatever the, the, the car uh, intelligence that is uh, rolled out still has that uh, essence of what it's approved. You cannot have a, a uh, you know, self-learning system that really deviates a lot more to the to the, you know to get more risky or to more you know safety conscious um, so that the, whatever is approved by the government has to be retained that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, the 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 process so you know it, it is okay to learn uh, the if, for you to go from home to home uh, to office you like to take the one way or the other that's perfectly okay. But if uh, the self learning aspect of AI becomes too smart and, and it really deviates and change the behavior of your car and that becomes an issue. Yeah, that's a big challenge. And, and actually there's a, a new requirement in the UK which has been very forward thinking in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, incorporating requirements for AVs into their insurance framework that software updates, to your point, Michael, need to be updated also in terms of what the capabilities are of the vehicle. Because as we know, that is probably how uh, autonomous vehicles are going to be upgraded through over-the-air updates. And that the car that you might purchase or maybe it's part of a fleet uh, in the uh, next year or two is not going to be the same five years after that because there's going to be a lot of software improvements and upgrades. So that's going to be, I think, a requirement that regulators are going to have as well. And so it'll be interesting to see how that's, that's accommodated. Yeah, that's a good point because you're going to get software updates for cybersecurity patches on a pretty ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And that's inevitable as That's you have right. the cars being controlled by software, you only know what you know the day you put in the software into right. the car. You don't know that there's vulnerabilities that get exposed six months later. Right, right. right. exactly.
I mean, like today, we're helping our customers building cars for, you know, three years later, five years later. And, uh, you know, we're putting our latest and greatest uh, software, like the uh, uh, today's Android version. But when the car hits the market five years later, you cannot have an Android version that is five years old. So it got to be uh, yeah. over the year updates has to be there. Will, will that mean that cars will just automatically self upgrade all the time? I mean, that, will that be communicating so that just as sometimes your, you know, various apps on your computer upgrade themselves? You know? Yeah, I think so. I absolutely. I think that, you know, if I've got an automated system, it doesn't even have to be autonomous drive. If I have, you know, lane keep assist and there's a security bug, car makers are going to want to push that out right away. And, and not only that, they're going to want to fix warranty issues. Before the people have, before the car the car has to go back into the shop. So I think over the air software updates is going to be, you know, we've been talking about over the air software updates for a long time for vehicles. Believe it or not, it's not very pervasive yet. It's just actually starting now. Uh, so I think it's going to be very important, and the car will be. Not only will you have software updates, I actually believe the cars in the future will be monitored very closely from a kind of a vehicle health perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's we, one of the key. Uh, key ideas for why there might be um, a first deployment in fleets yeah. of some because the maintenance can be more uh, carefully controlled and there can be uh, decentralized maintenance areas for example where where vehicles go every night to be checked and updated and make sure all the sensors and cameras and everything that's essential for safety be checked rather than returning to an individual's garage and, um, you know, maybe not given that level of, of care. Wow. So many interesting things. Well, it's time for to open it up to, to, to uh, some of the uh, questions from the audience. Um, and I'm going to take one from um, our participant, an uh, member, uh, audience participant, Will, Philip Wilcox, who says, with China relying on infrastructure, 5G and other V2X capabilities. Will that hurt China's effort to export AVs to other countries that don't have the same infrastructure set up? Good question. Um, I d don't think so because if you really look at what the, what is happening today, they are also looking at all the different sensors, all the uh, onboard computing power and uh, the um, uh, self-driving algorithms. Uh, so they will have that kind of uh, capability on board uh, so they're leveraging both. Um, I think the uh, the way that they are leveraging the uh, the outside elements, such as the um, the, the flashlights, uh, the the traffic lights, and and light poles, that gives them additional information, so that they can uh, uh, give additional uh, ways to to support this ecosystem. But Without it, you still have the uh, the um, the self driving capabilities with the cars. Yeah, and and I also expect that in the U.S. you will start to see the infrastructure get into get into place as well. I think there was a lot of uh, perhaps waiting on whether it would be you know digital shortwave radio, which was what was used for a lot of Vita X in the past. I think with with five G you're gonna see this accelerate pretty quickly, even on the US side. So I don't expect that to be a big differentiator down the road. I agree. Good, well, another question we have from um, Rosie Levine is, is um, she thanks all the panelists for the presentations. How will AVs impact public transportation? And we've seen very monumental dips in public transportation ridership during the pandemic. Could AVs be an asset to cities as they consider ways to reinvigorate public transportation? We looked at this in our 2016 RAND report. And at that time, we thought that, you know, we don't have enough information yet, but certainly if you're able to enjoy the benefits of public transportation, which would be, you don't have to pay attention to the driving function, you can chat with your friend or, or read your email, and you're able to do that in an autonomous vehicle, whether it's a fleet vehicle or one that, that, that you're, you're driving yourself, there could well be a, a diminution in terms of the use of public transportation. However, on the other hand, as we've been talking about, one of the initial deployments may be shuttle buses and services, uh, um, 
autonomous vehicles that are, are in a using a particular route. Perhaps it's a link even between a, a metro and a, and a bus. But so I think that, that it's really an open question to see how public transit may uh, accommodate autonomous vehicles. I'd be very interested to see what John and Michael think. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Carla. I mean, we're, what we're seeing is, you know, mixed modality of travel. So the AV shuttles used for last mile, for instance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so a proliferation of, of light rail as a centralized line, mm -hmm. and then using these mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles. And, and the beauty with these autonomous vehicles is they can be buses or they can be small shuttles. They can run mm -hmm. frequently or they can run infrequently. They can be hailed or not hailed. And mm -hmm. so we are seeing, you know, at least where I have visibility, uh, that this is something that cities are thinking very strongly as a way of reinvigorating uh, public transportation, because mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm guessing it's worldwide, but the pandemic has actually helped the car companies continue okay. to sell cars right. at a very high level, yeah. right. you know, right. so I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, uh, from my perspective, I think it's still too early to tell in China. Uh, I think uh, they are uh, a lot of uh, trials going on, a lot of uh, uh, technology uh, implementations and uh, people seem to enjoy it. But on the other hand, uh, I think Chinese government will have to really look at uh, how do you really manage um, man versus machine, right? Uh, so if, our, uh, if, if you get all the robot taxis uh, and, and uh, stop, uh, start uh, replacing all the taxi drivers, then you might have a, uh, an issue in your hands with a lot of uh, uh, people that are gonna be displaced from their, their workplace. Uh, sanitation, they can you know, potentially send a whole bunch of uh, sanitation trucks out there and clean the streets every day. Then you're, you're re replacing a lot of laborers in, uh, mm -hmm. in China. And that could become a, a very, very uh, concerning issue for, for the pe from a people perspective. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've got a question coming in from uh, the National Committee's president, Steve Orleans, who's uh, learned a lot here, he says, and he wants to ask the panelists to talk about the use of, of the technology we've been discussing for military uses. How will this influence the opportunity for the U.S. and China to cooperate on developing that technology? Well, I worked on a, a project actually for the U.S. Army uh, concerning the integration of autonomous vehicles. And the military has a very different viewpoint than a commercial viewpoint. And the, the key concern for the military is what they call force protection, meaning getting people out of the convoy trucks or the military vehicles that could put them in harm's way and finding a way, for example, to have a leader follower, kind of a situation where you might have a driver in a, uh, a leading vehicle, but other vehicles can, can follow. So, but there are big challenges for military vehicles, and that is particularly the terrain. Military vehicles have to cope with uh, off-road situations and uh, uncharted terrain, not mapped. So they're, they're really very, distinct challenges from the military side. So over to you, John and Michael. Well, I, I think definitely the technology, purely the technology is applicable to all those scenarios. Uh, as far as cooperation, I don't have any, any real clear sight on that one. I, I would say though that from a technology perspective, yes, there are different, definitely different you know, aspects of it, but we're doing autonomous drive for mining equipment. We're doing you know, autonomous drive for heavy, heavy machinery. This is just yet another use case, but the technology is definitely applicable. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, it's a great question. Um, I, I, yeah, I echo John that um, uh, from a technology perspective, it doesn't prevent both countries working together, but I think ultimately uh, there's a, a, a huge trust issue between the country, countries. And uh, without really overcoming the trust issue, it will be hard for both countries working together, uh, especially in the military development, uh, technology development aspect. And uh, 
uh, I, I think it's probably uh, more realistic on the commercial side, on the uh, technology side, uh, you know, uh, working in, in private uh, uh, collaboration. Interesting and somewhat similar. We've got a question from uh, Bridget Donovan. Could you discuss the cybersecurity terrorism risks for autonomous vehicles and how the US and China might take steps to address this threat? You know, I don't know if it's the same as for smartphones, but you know. Well, so we it, 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 it is. I mean, it's, it's top of mind for the OEMs. I'm sure it's top of mind for the OEMs in China and the OEMs in, in uh, the rest of the world. Uh, you know, that is the fear. No OEM wants to be the first OEM that has their vehicles hacked and controlled. Uh, just as a little anecdote, uh, I talked about in my opening statement that in 2014 uh, was when we really started to see the autonomous drive kind of kick, kind of come in. And uh, some of you may be familiar that CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, is probably the largest automotive electronics show in the world. And in 2014, it was all about autonomous drive. In 2015, it was all about cybersecurity because there had been a Jeep hack. A Jeep had been hacked in North America by white hat hackers where they were able to actually get into the, the vehicle through a cellular connection and control functions within the vehicle. So it was a real wake up call to, to the automotive world. Uh, so it is top of mind, it is very, very uh, important. Uh, you know, to what extent are we going to collaborate on cybersecurity with, with the Chinese? I think we already are. We're selling some of our products into to China. We are working collaboratively in this area to secure the vehicles. Uh, to what extent that'll go is time will tell. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, if you really look at um, a lot of the, uh, from there are two parts from cart perspective and the infrastructure around it and the, uh, you know, from, from a wireless connectivity uh, connections. So for in the, in, inside the car, uh, a lot of uh, uh, automakers are uh, developing their technology, separating the um, uh, the mission critical, the really the uh, the uh, uh, functional safety related uh, uh, aspect of uh, of the technology, separate from the in entertainment and the personal use of the uh, the functionalities. So we leverage uh, you know John's uh, uh, QNX hypervisor, developing a lot of these uh, of, uh, systems to separate those and really making sure that uh, those two. Uh, functions don't uh, intersect, and you don't want to have your, you know, teenage son to be able to uh, uh, start driving yourself in the back, uh, driving the car from from the back seat. Uh, and then, uh, in in terms of the um, uh, outside the infrastructure and wireless connectivity, uh, China is uh, really uh, strong in terms of uh, managing and and, and controlling. You know who has access and, and what are the things that are being um, uh, developed. Uh, so they are definitely one of the uh, uh, really high, highly controlled and secured, uh, especially on the infrastructure that they're 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 rolling out. Well, that's just one of the questions sort of relating to the data that comes again from Phil Wilcox um, is you know with people valuing their data in both the U.S. and China, could there be a one globe two systems where the data could not be accessed? across the two spheres that might lead to real more competition and maybe conflict. I don't know whether that's gonna, something that might pan out. I, 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 I think I, I understand the question, but uh, ultimately, you know, we, we can do pretty much anything you want from a technology perspective, but it's, it's a matter of trust, whether if you really trust that the system is controlling and not, not uh, you know, uh, the re revealing the information or data or sharing the data with the people that are not supposed to handle. So, uh, so there's, uh, uh, I think that is the, uh, the issue that, that I see is the major challenges between the two countries right now. Yeah, I agree. I don't know that I could add much to that. I think that's, that's exactly right. And technically there's nothing preventing it. Well, and you know, I always have to raise the regulatory issues. So I think that's a, that's another potential uh, issue. Yeah. Well, it does raise the question of whether, you know, US and China can look at regulations together, because if you're going to be trying to sell cars manufactured in the United States into China and vice versa, I mean, should, should there be some consistency in regulation or some areas where they are consistent? 
or can you have totally separate regulations? Oh, I think from a from a simple economics, you, you certainly want to have a set of regulations that make sense uh, into all the geographies that you're selling into. So I think as a, as a forcing function, as the, as the uh, Chinese OEMs mature, and I think, you know, there's a lot of Chinese OEMs. I think you'll see consolidation of the Chinese OEMs over time, and then they'll definitely start selling into the rest of the world. Uh, and I guess time will tell what that looks like, but there definitely will have to be some shared regulations to be able to cross sell. Yeah, I think that that is absolutely right. I think there, there uh, most likely will be some shared regulation uh, that would be uh, common to both countries. Uh, but, you know, just because of the, um, um, the culture, the um, uh, you know, laws and differences, uh, there will be differences between two countries, and, uh, which is, uh, to me, it's okay. Well, I'm glad we got this question because a part of our recent RAND report, which I didn't mention, is that we interviewed experts from four countries, from the UK, Australia, Japan, and Canada, who are all taking steps to look at um, how to regulate autonomous vehicles. And one of the recommendations of our report, one of the three key recommendations is that U.S. automakers, uh, pardon me, U.S. Um, policymakers look to models in other countries to see how other countries have resolved some of the same issues concerning liability and other challenges. So I think, Michael, you're, you're right in that there may be an effort to try to harmonize some of the, the regulations. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you know, we talked about the ownership of data, um, you know, in China, maybe uh, it's, it's probably owned by the, the party, owned by the, uh, uh, the government, uh, it has a lot more control over uh, the data access and, and other things, whereas in the US, there may be privacy issues and other things that, that prevents mm -hmm. from having the same regulations and standards. Uh, so there may be some, some differences that uh, uh, different countries might have to uh, follow their own rule. Well, I, I, I want to say, I want to thank you. I, mean, I feel like we've almost just scratched the surface, to be quite honest with you. And I say that as, a, as very much somebody who does not know the field and, and, and want to thank you all, especially for explaining it in a way that is, is comprehensible to people for whom this is still very, very new. I, I, I mean, I'm just thinking that these issues, the challenges of how do you deal with the data? And, and it seems like ownership and use are almost different concepts too at the same time. And, and how we're going to be able to, 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 to look to the development of these cars as, and also so as a lead into our next uh, program, how that's going to affect smart cities because this is going to be such a key part of it. Um, I think you, you, you've really outlined so many of the, of the issues and, and done it so well. And I think there is, you know, obviously great areas for collaboration between our two countries in this really dynamic and ever-changing um, technology. So uh, again, thank you to the three of our, 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 our uh, panelists for, for a really interesting conversation. I want to thank uh, all of our audience for their attending and for those who have asked questions. And I particularly want to thank, again, BlackBerry for making this program possible. And uh, just to say again, I hope that you will join us again for the Smart Cities uh, event that is the follow on to this program, which will take place, as I said, in early May and will be posted on our website soon. So with that, uh, thank you to Michael, John and Carlin again, and uh, have a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye-bye.